music education studies, chamber music, and reed making with Philip Hill. Stay inspired. Thank you, and let's get started. So, Philip, one of our first questions is from Rashawn and has asked, what is your favorite reed shape? Probably Fox 2. I've been using Fox 2 for several years now. Um, honestly, I don't remember any other shape that, that I've used consistently, um, but Fox 2 has always been pretty reliable, regardless of what type of cane I'm using. It's not too narrow. Um, and and that for me is more of the feeling of the reed. Um, I don't like the feeling of a narrow reed in my mouth. Um, I I like my sound when I'm playing on a narrow reed. If I can get the scrape right, because again I'm used to scraping on a fox too. Um, so if I can get the scrape right on a more narrow reed like uh, fox one or reed or one a or something like that, um, Harrodsburg, then I feel like I sound maybe a little bit better. It just feels so uncomfortable that it's, it's not worth it to me. Um, I mean, Rieger is Rieger one a is a pretty good shape. It's if I had to pick something that's more narrow, that's probably the next one I would go to. Um, let me see. There was a shape that I can't remember it off the top of my head right now, but, um, I tried it last summer. Actually, it, it wasn't Rieger. It wasn't and I wish I could remember off the top of my head, but there was something that's a little more narrow and, um, and it, it's the same type of cane. It's, it's Argentina Gonzalez cane. Um, so the, the type of the cane actually seems to matter maybe a little bit more for me than the shape. Philip, can you share more about your cane? And a, another, another part with the reeds is of course your bassoon is going to, your bassoon is going to have, um, a big say in what kind of cane you should be using. So just because I say I use Fox 2 all the time doesn't mean everyone else should do it too. My, my students, you know, even my private students, maybe they should be playing on a different shape. Um, but, but speaking of that, I play on a Moosman thick wall bassoon. It's a 222A. Um, so I do need something that's kind of bright to, to balance that out. Um, my bassoon is very, I, I wouldn't really use the term dark for my bassoon because it seems like everyone uses that term to the point where it doesn't really have any meaning anymore. <laughs> um, as to me, someone will have a bright sound and then someone else says, Oh, your, your sound is really dark. And, and so I, I don't really know what that word means anymore, but um, honestly, if on my bassoon, if I don't have the right cane, then the sound is really dull. It's not dark. It's just dull. This it, kind of, it's kind of like, I don't know, like a, a refrigerator humming or like a broken air conditioning or something like that. So I, I do need a bright reed. So Fox two is, um, is wider and the Gonzalez cane. It's not too thick. Um, and then if, if I scrape a little bit more in the middle of the cane, than most people would, um, and then I get, I get a, I get a more free blowing sound that I'm looking for and that any bassoonist would be looking for in their sound. And in the feeling of um, playing on the cane, um, I actually just bought a tip profiler. So um, before when I when I would scrape my reeds, I, I realized that that's when I was kind of realizing like, oh, I need to scrape more. Like everyone says, you know, don't scrape at the heart of the cane because then you you ruin the reed. Um, I could actually get away with that a, a little bit, um, depending on how long I leave my reeds. So I clip them to about. It's, yeah, again, it's Fox 2, Gonzalez, Kane, or Arjun Donex, whatever you call it. It's all Gonzalez. It's all the same. Um, so I use that type of, that shape, that, and that type of cane, and then I clip it to, my final length is usually 28. Sometimes I have a really good read that's a little longer. Sometimes, very rarely, I have to clip it shorter than that. Um, but 28 seems to be the magic number. Um, oh, and I guess I should be more specific. 28 to the collar. Some people measure from the first wire. So 28 is the magic number for me. And I scrape a little bit more in the center of the tip and maybe even just behind that than most people would. 
Um, I, when I was using a knife, I had a bad habit of scraping way too much out of the sides, um, not the sides, the, um, the corners or the, that, or yeah, I guess the outsides, the outside of the reed. And that, that was really to my detriment, kind of that, that actually killed the sound for me. Um, but, but I found that if I kind of stay away from that area and, and focus more on like when I look at the tip opening, it's a very even scrape. It doesn't appear that the center is thicker than the outsides. If it's exactly even for me, that's actually where I have my best sound. Um, and and then the tip profiler that I bought, or, or sorry, the template for the tip profiler that I have does that. Um, it takes that cane out of the center. So... And I, and I just got it, so I'm still getting used to it. So hopefully my my subsequent Instagram videos are not too. <laughs> hopefully those videos are okay. And <laughs> my next my next concert's coming up with the Midland Odessa Symphony. I kind of just sand the back down. The the cane that I get from um, I get it from Womble Williams. With that cane and my my climate, I don't really have to do anything to the back of the reed. Um, depending on the time of year, I might have to sand the back of the cane a little bit more but if i just take really fine sandpaper and just both sides then it's good to go this is from rachel what is the length of the collar so i guess from the bottom of the first wire up to the up to the collar that's two and a half millimeters ethan is asked what benefit is there to scraping the heart if you need to play the opening of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, <laughs> something really, really low. <laughs> um, well, again, it depends on what kind of bassoon you have. I mean, if you have if you have a Fox or a Heckel or a Puchner that just, I mean, the tuning is like, like if everything just rides sharp, your bassoon is susceptible. Then yeah, don't don't scrape there. But my bassoon is. is um, I don't know. My bassoon is weird. Moosemans are weird. <laughs> it's just, I, I actually, I mean, I love my instrument. I, it, just the way it feels and just the general sound of it. I, I love the way it projects. Um, and, and especially the vocal that I have, it's a Moosman vocal. Um, but you know, if I, my, I have to be very, very, tri uh, very particular with my reads. And I've realized that with my bassoon, it's, um, I've, I've learned how to play on bad reeds, but my bassoon hasn't learned how to, <laughs> how to play on a bad reed. Like, and, and, and what I mean by that is like, I can kind of make something work. Um, like I, I can get the note to speak. It just might not be soft enough or it might not be loud enough or, but the, the tuning is generally fine. So if I need to scrape, at a read like that. I mean, yeah, if it's something like I'm, I'm playing, you know, really low stuff in a wind quintet or where I'm the only bassoonist on an orchestra concert. Um, so normally I'm playing principal first, the first part. So I'm playing by myself and playing low parts, then, well, maybe I will scrape just a little bit more out of there, but generally I just leave it alone. If I, if I scrape my reads just right. And now I have this tip profiler that does it for me. If I do that just right, then, all my notes pretty much play in tune, the, un, unless I need to change the wires. I, I try and do my best to not change anything besides the wires after I've, once I've cut it open and it's been like three or four days, hopefully I don't have to do anything to the, to the, the blade. I just change the, the shape of the wire, the shape of the tube with the wires. On the Music Link YouTube interview that we did um, with your read making length and timeline that you're kind of experimenting right now could you talk a bit more about your assembly line going yeah so oh and this yes so this read that i showed you this was the mummy from the interview it's alive i i could wrap it right now i just haven't gotten around to it um I've been i've been cutting open blanks that have already been made and all sorts of other things um but my timeline as of now, and, and I'll reiterate, I said this in the, in the interview, but I'll reiterate for now that I am sort of going through a read making timeline protocol change. Obviously, like I, I have a tip profiler now, 
um, and just different things. So anyway, um, I buy my cane GSP. So the first thing I do is I'll, I'll try and soak my reeds for, normally I soak them about 30 to 45 minutes and then I sand the inside and I, and I do this. That's what, that's what I originally did. I just, I would make it look like this that day, but now I'm, um, I'm going to leave it, leave the string on it for a week. So this, this had string on it for a week. And then whatever day, what does this say? January 5th. So when was that? Tuesday or Wednesday? I think I can't remember. That's when I took the string off and then I did the beveling after I put it on the pin. Actually, um, I used to bevel before I did that. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to bevel after I put it on the pin. So I take the string off, I bevel it, and then I put these wires on. And of course you have to tighten it a little bit because the cane shrinks after it dries. So that's why it's not on that little line anymore. Okay. And then, um, again, I could wrap this right now. I just haven't gotten around to it. So I normally use string and, um, do go. Um, I, I just like, I like the, the feeling of holding that turban. It just feels, it just feels good. Um, that's really the main reason why I use Duco and the turban. Um, and it looks cool. So, <laughs> So then, um, let me see, did I skip a step? So yeah, a week, it's a mummy for a week. Mummy is when you have the string wrapped around it. That's for a week and then I wrap it and then it's a blank. And then for blanks, normally, normally I like to have the blanks sit for at least a month. If I can have them sit longer, that would be nice. Um, if I don't have time to have them sit longer, then I'll just hope and pray that it's going to be a good read anyway when I cut it open and that the shape of the tube doesn't mess up. But ideally it sits in the box for at least a month as a blank. Um, and then it's been about five weeks at this point, I guess it's been about five weeks. And so after that month, hopefully much more than that, um, maybe like five or six months, that would be nice. Um, I just, I take the read and I double check the placement and the tightness of the wires particularly the first wire. The second wire is not going to change if I, if I wrap it with the string and the duco, because I wrap the string all the way here. I'll show you. one. I wrap the string all the way up to the, the second wire like that. So that second wire is not going to change where it is, but it, it might change how tight it is. So I put it on a forming mandrel again, make sure the wires are tight when it's dry. Then it then it really has I like tight wires so it really has a good tightness to it and the the, the um, what do you call it the blades vibrate against each other really well when the when the um, when the wires are tight enough and if you beveled it right then that fulcrum still works even though your wires are super tight so anyway I tighten the wires check the placement double check that and then I just put it in the water um, I used to clip it open first and then put it in the water. Um, but I tried a couple by soaking it first and I think that something, there's something about cutting it open and then putting it in the water that makes the shape of the blades warp and, and change a bit, especially if I didn't have enough time to let the reed just sit as a blank or sit as a mummy. So I have a suspicion that it's better to tighten the wires dry and then soak it, but don't clip it open. And then when you clip it open and start scraping at it, you're already, you're like, yeah, you're looking at it and it's, it might be changing a little bit when you scrape it, but just don't scrape too much at one time. So I originally, I used to just do everything in one day or like not everything, but everything. Um, Cause you, you know, you're still going to do stuff to your reads after like a week or something of, um, of cutting it open and, and doing stuff to it. Um, but normally I would just cut it open to 28 and then I'd scrape the tip and then I'd sand the back down and I'd play on it a little bit and it, and it might be, it's probably going to sound really weird, but every now and then it sounds great. And I'm like, Oh, cool. It sounds great. Or, Oh no, it sounds terrible. And then I just put it away because it's inevitably going to sound different the next day. But, um, 
lately what I've been doing is clipping it open to 29 and a half first and scraping it as if that were the or that as if that were the finishing length. Um, I don't sand the back. I don't do anything to the back. I just do the front, the front third of the reed, as if that's the finishing length. Play on it. It's going to sound flat. That's I, I. I would never actually perform on a reed that's that long, um, unless your orchestra plays really flat. Unless you have one of those period orchestras or something, where they, you know, they have the period instruments and everything. Um, <laughs> But I, I've never had that opportunity. That would be nice to do that. But anyway, so I, I do that as if that's the finishing length. And then I cut it to 28 and then do that all over again, then sand it down. Uh, um, and I know some people might say, well, day one scrape, day two, day three. I'm going to try that. I'm, I'm actually going to try that and spread them out. So I have another box. So, oh, I didn't bring it. I have a box that keeps three reads in it to make a little visual timeline for myself. So the first day, let's say today I cut, cut open a read, 29 and a half millimeters, cut it open, put it on the tip profiler now instead of scraping it by hand, um, and then play on it a little bit. It's going to sound terrible. Let it sound terrible. And then just put it away. The next day, cut it to 28, do the same thing on the tip profiler, and it's going to take less cane off because you already put it on the tip profiler. So it might look like there's nothing coming off, but it's doing something for sure. Um, play on it again. It might still sound weird because now it's shorter, it's harder, the back of the cane doesn't have anything taken out. It, it might be a little tough to play on, um, but it's probably a little more in tune. Put it away, leave it alone. Third day, I sand the back and cut the corners. And hopefully it sounds really good. Um, if not, it might, if not the fourth day, that's kind of like decision day where I'm like, is this going to be for me or is this going to be for a student or is this going to be for the garbage? Um, hopefully by that fourth day, it's pretty obvious where it's going to go. And, and it, it usually is. Philip, Ethan also had a question about scoring. What scoring techniques have you found useful in not creating cracks through the collar during the forming process? So as far as specifically scoring, um, there, there are other factors involved in making sure the reed doesn't crack. If, you, if you're making reads, you, you know that. But as far as specifically scoring, um, I like to just make as many scores as possible all the way up to the collar. Um, just doing that and then and then of course don't score too deep and don't score too thin so for me with this fox 2 shape I end up having around um, it's something like eight or nine scores that's generally how many I fit on on the tube um, all the way up to the collar no, or not all the way up I because um, you don't want to get it into the blade because that might actually increase the chance of cracking the blade when you form it. Um, I go, I kind of eyeball it, honestly. Maybe that's a bad, maybe that's like a, you should smack my hand and say bad bassoon player. But honestly, I eyeball it. I just, I just score um, up to the collar, but it's really up to the first wire. So I kind of imagine where that first wire is going to be. And I mean, if you're making reads all the time and you put your wire in the same spot every time you're, and you're using the same length of cane every time, you're going to be able to eyeball that spot. You don't need to mark it with a Sharpie or anything. So yeah, I just, I just go up to where the first wire would be as many scores as possible. Um, not too deep, not too um, shallow. Um, and then, and then of course there's all the other factors that are not really with scoring. I use an exacto knife. Um, there is a tool that you can get from like Lowe's or something. It's, I forget what it's called. It's called a drill something. It, it's a, it's a part of a drill and you turn it sideways and it has the little, it has those little divots in it. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called because I don't use it, but I've seen other bassoon players use it and it, it does the same job that an exacto knife does. It's just quicker because you have a bunch of it's not just one blade. There's like seven or eight of them. 
So you can just do it three times down the tube and, and it just does it quicker. Clarissa has another question. How do you like to sand the back of your reed? So if you look here, uh, let's see, hopefully that's pretty defined. Look how, uh, yeah, it's maybe it's a little blurry for most people, but my collar is pretty defined and that's actually how I get it. That's how it's purchased. So I don't do anything to the collar itself. I've, I've bought it that way. Um, if you look at, um, let me see if I can find it really quickly on YouTube. Wamba Williams has a video on YouTube where they explain the process of how they process their cane. So when you buy GSP cane from them, you're buying cane from a profiler that profiles sideways. Um, most people, when they take like a, a hand a hand operated profiler profiler and they go like that they're profiling from one part from one end of the tube to the other this profiler goes sideways so like if this is the cane it it profiles it this way so you're getting a, an extremely defined collar so i i don't have to do anything to my collar that's just where it is um, if anything, if, um, and I know this isn't really the question you asked, but this is normally the next thing that comes up when people say that, um, since my collar is so defined, I really depend on when I fold it, the collars line up because I don't want to have to change where my collar is. Cause if I change where it is, it's not going to be as exact as, um, the other side of the collar which was perfect when it came out of the machine. Um, so normally what I do is I just fold it. And if it doesn't line up, I try and like kind of finagle with it to make it line up. And that makes the tip look a little weird, but that gives you collars that line up and then you just have to sand the butt and it makes you read. It makes the tube shorter, but um, I'd rather have a slightly shorter tube with even collars than um, a normal length tube with uneven collars. But anyway, so as far as sanding, I use um, not, um, nine microns. It's very, very smooth sandpaper. Again, this profile that I get from Wamba Williams on my bassoon and my climate, I don't have to do that much to it. So I just use nine microns and I just do a general sanding on the back half of the cane. Um, that's pretty much it. Again, every now and then, depending on the weather, depending on the time of year, Year, I might have to sand a little bit more down if it's colder outside and maybe the pressure is a little lower outside. Um, but generally just nine microns, dip it in the water so it, it actually cuts both sides and then it's good to go. Hopefully it's good to go. If not, I give it to a, a student who might play on it better or I just throw it away. Could you talk more about your Instagram page and the videos that you share? Sure. So my Instagram page is called Bassoon at Large. Um, I have uh, uh, I have a right now. Currently, I'm working on the Orifici Etudes. I figured with um, not many in-person concerts and rehearsals and. There's a lot of virtual lessons, so I don't have to pack up from a lesson and go home. I'm already at home, and they're not here. I don't have to see them out the door. I have I have more time, so um, I figured, you know what? Let's let's get let's work on an etude book that I haven't really worked on that much. I, I didn't really do much Orifici at all uh, during my studies, so I said, you know what? Let's let's do that and put it on Instagram. So so that's the thing that I'm consistently working on now, and. Most of my videos are something like that. It's just me playing uh, by myself, working on whatever I need to work on at the time um, from from things that I decide, like if it's Orifici or if it's um, orchestra music, wind quintet music, um, things like that. Every now and then I'll post about reads. Um, very recently, beginning of the year, I, I, um, I made a post explaining one of my new year's resolutions that is to have way more blanks on hand by the end of the year than I normally have. Um, that again, this, I'm going to throw myself under the bus here, but, 
but normally my average amount of blanks that I have at one, one time is probably like 20. And, and most professional bassoonists, or maybe especially bassoon teachers, they have a lot of students, they'll say, that, that's not enough. How could you possibly have only that many reads? And somehow it's worked. I think there's only been one time where a student's like, I need reads. And I'm like, I don't have any. <laughs> Most of the time I, I have some. So I've just, I've just thought, well, just make reads when I have the time, um, which is normally during the summer. But I said, you know what? What if I had, oh, let's start with two blanks a week. Again, there's 52 weeks in a year. So that's how I came up with the number 104. So I think every month I'll kind of go in my box and, and see like, okay, how many reads do I have now? And I'm already at 20. I made a post saying I have 28. Um, of course, that's lower now because I've had to cut open some and um, sell them to my students or play on them on my own. Um, but I just bought some more cane. So in about a month, it, it'll probably shoot back up by quite a bit. So yeah, my, my personal Instagram page is mostly just me playing. Um, right now it's Orifici. Um, and once I'm done with Orifici, whenever that will be, hopefully it won't be too much longer. I thought I'd be done by now. <laughs> um, once I'm done with Orifici, I'll move to another etude book or some sort of series like that. They're all um, IGTV videos. So um, if anyone has any suggestions for etude books, well, I hesitate to invite suggestions because, of, <laughs> <laughs> but someone, you know, someone's going to say, well, play all the Mozart symphony. These are, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing, I'm willing to do, you know, fun thing. things like that. Could you share more about the work that you do with the West Texas winds and your new YouTube podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So another Another thing that was sort of birthed out of this, you know, unprecedented time in human history was uh, the West Texas Wings to uh, decision to start a start a podcast. It's called From the Archives. And we the five of us get together and we pull up recordings from, from past concerts and um, any other performance opportunities. And the first half not exactly half, like 50%, but the first part of the show is us discussing what went into rehearsing, performing, securing a venue, um, securing the sheet music, all sorts of things like that. It's a, it's a discussion. And then the second part is we present the recording. Um, and usually it's a live recording. So you might hear people coughing, babies crying, um, someone, someone, you know, sneezing, people soaking reads or dropping reads or swabbing out or whatever it might be turning pages <laughs> saying, yes, nailed it. I got that note. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, here's the link to our, now that YouTube channel, we, we post our videos through our symphony channel. We, we do not have our own channel. we like to have everything through the symphony, um, at least for now. And I think we have, how many episodes do we have so far? I think it's four and we should have a fifth episode coming out shortly. Um, so that's what we do online. We do also have an Instagram page. Um, it's called West Texas Wind. And then we have a Facebook page too. West Texas Winds. It's all West Texas Winds. Um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. And even on, on YouTube, you can click that link. And even if you just search on YouTube, West Texas Winds, we should still come up. Um, you probably don't have to go directly through the symphony. You, uh, you can find us there. Um, so that's what we do online. Um, in person, our normal, normal season is a biannual concert, uh, two concerts a year. And we play, and then we play just various other performances um, in the area. We have um, agreements with different locations, like um, we have... That, like there's a memorial service at um, a place in Odessa every year. We have we we have played at a bank. I think it's West Texas National Bank. Several times a year, um, just other things that that's kind of known that yeah we sort of do that every year. 
Um, and then other opportunities just come up. So we rehearse um, on average, it's about um, on, throughout the year, it's about once a week. I mean, we don't meet during the summer. Our, our symphony is, we don't, it's not, not a summer orchestra. It's um, more like an academic calendar, follows the academic calendar for schools. Um, so that's our normal rehearsal schedule every week and always preparing for that, that symphony concert. So, and actually to tie back to what we do online, um, our, our series from the archives is normally pulled from our biannual concerts. Your quintet being part of the orchestra, could you talk more about the behind the scenes scheduling and kind of how you work as a unit going out in the community? This orchestra is very blessed to have three resident chamber uh, chamber ensembles. It, it's a it's a regional orchestra. It's a small one, um, but we have very very generous um, donors and supporters who have um, who uh, have we we have the Lone Star Brass, and we have the Permian Basin String Quartet, and then us West Texas Winds. So all of us are. We are principal members of our orchestra, so let um, and we do have we do have some vac uh, vacancies right now. So let's say you know you're auditioning for you're auditioning for a spot, and uh, the the spot that you audition for is principal of whatever section in the orchestra, and then it also includes that chamber ensemble. Um, and with this orchestra, the bulk of your time is actually spent in the chamber ensemble. Um, our orchestra meets, we have a concert roughly once a month. And sometimes it's more often than that, but it's about once a month. Um, the chamber ensembles normally meet about once a week. Um, so we're, we're, we're very, like our core musicians, the principal musicians, and some other non-principal musicians too, we're, we, um, we're kind of the, the face of the community. Um, and it, and it's really nice to have the chamber group because since we don't, since our orchestra doesn't meet, um, um, every week of the year, we don't meet during the summer. Um, it's good to have that chamber group that is meeting at least with each other more actively. And then they go out and, and they have other endeavors they're into. Like some of us are, adjunct faculty at universities, or we have a bunch of private students. Um, maybe some of us even have full-time jobs as orchestra directors, band directors, things like that. Um, some of us are conductors, composers, um, arrangers. Um, we, we do recordings and things like that. So, and, and some of us even play with other orchestras too. So, um, the, so the chamber groups are kind of the, it's kind of like that emulsifier that brings everything in the symphony together. Um, and it, it's really, really great to have that in, in such a, um, a small orchestra. It's normally the bigger orchestras like Chicago, New York, Boston that have things like that. Is there a favorite book recommendation that you could suggest for people to check out? Let's see, I've, been, I've actually been getting into uh, quite a few Christian books lately. Um, I just finished reading a book called Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. Um, that is, so that book is, I can't remember the subtitle, but it's basically about, um, it's a nonfiction, you know, explanation about how pretty much every man is in some way kind of, as a child, they're sort of like their father kind of ruins them. Their, their father makes a mistake because, you know, no parent is perfect. So they have this wound from their father. And then you have to go to your heavenly father to, to find, to heal that wound. You, you shouldn't, um, a lot of times you can go back to your, your earthly father. Um, you can, but you shouldn't go to anyone else, especially not, you know, your companion, your spouse, your, your significant other. That's, that's a big no, no. You got to go, you have to go to your heavenly father. And I really, really enjoyed that book. Um, especially because, um, well, one thing I'm a man, I have a father <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it's just really good to go through that book with some of the, some of the other people at my church. And we, we just spent six or seven weeks and, and talked about that book and discussed, you know, well, what was your childhood like? What about yours? And now that, that was really great to bond over that. So I think that's a really good book. And I, I think women should read it too. I, I think whoever you are, I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to be male to read the book. Um, 
there, there's a lot there. There's a lot there for women. And actually just to, as a little bonus, I'm reading the, I'm reading the, what was the lighting good? I don't know if the lighting's going to pick that up. There we go. There we go. So this is the female version of it. It's called captivating. Um, so this one is, is basically the same thing just written by his wife for women, but men, um, men, men should read it too. Honestly, I don't think men will get as much out of this as women will get out of the other book, but maybe that's just me, me personally. Um, as I'm reading through it, I'm like, eh, I'll finish it. I'm almost done. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't like to read a book like 75% of the way through. I feel kind of, you know, I, I feel like it's not done. I got to finish it, but it's, it's still, a, it's a good read. They're both, they're both very good reads. Are there any bassoon pieces that you could recommend people check out? I just found out that, and maybe we can get a little vote here in the chat or something. I just found out within the past couple months that Eugene Bordeaux has three solos, not just the premiere solo. Um, Cause a, a little while ago, you know, when we have all this free time and everything's virtual, I said, you know what, why is the Bordeaux solo called premiere solo? Did he write premier solo thinking he would write more and then he just never got around to it? I'm sure he has more. So I looked them up and then he has three. I don't know if he, maybe he has more. Maybe someone knows that he, he actually has more than three. But as far as I know, he has three. Um, so I, I was kind of doodling around with the third one a couple months ago. And I said, man, this is a really great piece. This is a lot of fun. It's super hard. The, at least for me, like the end, there's this little, a couple of spots at the end that are really, really tricky, but I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful piece and it's, it's a lot of fun to play. Um, so I de definitely recommend that Bordeaux solo number three. I mean, or if Fiji, I like the Orifici etudes <laughs> that it's really, especially number 15 that I, I think it's 15. It's in C sharp minor. It was E G sharp. G natural, da, da, da. I think that's 15, um, and C sharp minor. That one is, man, it's beautiful. I mean, anything Vivaldi. I mean, it's hard to pick just a couple bassoon pieces. Um, uh, I love the Vivaldi concerti. Those, those are just really great pieces. Why Kit Leong, Philip has asked, why did you pick Moosman over other brands? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I didn't really pick Moosman. Moosman actually just kind of fell in my lap. So when I was getting my bachelor's degree, um, I studied with Christopher Ulfers at East Carolina University. And he is, he's pretty good friends, pretty good colleagues with Justin Miller at Miller Marketing. And um, a lot of you might know that Miller Marketing is, is you know, the Moosman vendor in the United States. So when, when I was when I was about to graduate from, um, from college and I was thinking, well, I need to get my own bassoon because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about going to grad school and I, I can't not have my own bassoon going into grad school. I need to have my own if, if this is really what I want to do. So he said, well, go talk to Justin and see if you can get a, get a good deal on a bassoon from him. Um, I don't remember him specifically suggesting that I buy a Moosman, my, my professor. I don't remember him suggesting that. Um, especially because he plays on a heckle. Um, he doesn't play on a Moosman. So um, he just said, you know, talk to Justin, see if you can get one. And I said, okay. So um, I actually met with him in person at a music education conference because I, I was getting my bachelor's degree in music education. And, and he showed me some bassoons. And then um, I said, well, I kind of like these. And, and then he sent me some after the fact for me to, do on trial and they just happen to be moose mons. Um, and, and I, you know, Justin is a moose mon vendor. So he probably was encouraging me to buy a moose mon. Again, I like, I didn't at that age, I didn't know any stigmas with, Ooh, you have a heckle. Oh, you're, you're the best or, or, um, or like, Oh, you play on a moose mon. How could you? I didn't know any of that. I, I was just told by my professor who I trust, go talk to Justin. And I was buying reads from Justin at the time. And those, I felt really good playing on those reads. So I felt that buying a bassoon from him might not be a big deal either. 
And, and sure enough, it wasn't because the bassoon I bought from him, I, I loved a whole lot. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't really pick it. It's just that it kind of just fell into my lap. Um, I, I can't really. And I actually haven't played on many other kinds of bassoons besides Fox. So I even today, I, I still I can't still say that, like, well, I, I'm going to pick Moosman over the others. I don't think I've ever played on a, I played on one Puchner, a really, really old one. Um, but I don't think I've ever played on like a light singer or a heckle or, or a bell. Philip, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion today. We can go ahead and end this session.